doors of the White House, into the hopes and fears of men and women in their homes. Our capacity is limited only by our ability to work together. I am determined to do my share. Now, it is your turn. Hello everyone, my name is Steve Grove and I'm on the Community Partnerships team here for Google Plus in Mountain View, California. And I'd like to welcome you to a very special fireside hangout with President Obama. You heard the voices of, or the voice of Franklin Roosevelt there from his famous fireside chats of the 1930s and 40s. Well, this is a new tradition we've established with the President, a fireside hangout. This is actually the fourth year in a row that we've had the chance to sit down with the President after a State of the Union speech to hear your, his answers to your questions, both on YouTube and here on Google+. Perhaps fitting the, fittingly, the President is coming to us this year from the Roosevelt Room of the White House. Mr. President, welcome to Google+. Plus. It's great to talk to you, Steve. Uh, I have to admit, though, we do not have a fire going in the Roosevelt Room right now. <laughs> you, you know, well, maybe we can light one up uh, a little bit later. Uh, you know, we also are joined by five Americans here, all who watched the State of the Union speech and are looking forward to hanging out with you. Let's meet everybody. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Lee Doran. Uh, he is in Arlington, Virginia. Lee is a conservative online blogger and GOP strategist. His popular YouTube channel is called How the World Works. Hi, Mr. President. How are you, Steve? Next, we have John Green. John is the co-creator with his brother Hank of the popular Vlog Brothers channel on YouTube. John is also a number one New York Times bestselling author and is coming to us from Indianapolis, Indiana. Hi, Mr. President. Hi, John. We also have Lamore Free. Lamore is an entrepreneur and CEO of Adafruit, an electronics manufacturing education company in New York City. Hi, Mr. President. How are you? Good. Next to Lamore, we have Kira Davis. Kira is a conservative online video blogger and a proud stay-at-home mom of two in Orange County, California. Hi, Mr. President. It's great to hang out with you today. I'm uh, looking forward to it. And finally, joining us from Los Angeles is Jackie Guerrero. Jackie's the founder of My Culture, an online website that is devoted to LGBT and Latino issues. Hi, Mr. President. Hi, Jackie. How are you? Well, Mr. President, our team here at Google Plus selected these participants to represent a diverse set of perspectives, and also because they've connected to their online communities who have helped them think through their questions today. I should tell our viewers that neither the President nor anyone at the White House have seen these questions ahead of time. So let's get started. Mr. President, let's start with an issue that you actually ended your State of the Union on, reducing gun violence. And let's start with Kira. Hi, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Um, one of your solutions to uh, keeping powerful weapons out of the hands of bad people is to propose a ban on so-called assault rifles. However, according to the FBI's own statistics, the majority of death by gun in this country is perpetrated by handguns. Right. Do you think we should ban handguns? Well, I actually don't think we should ban handguns, but keep in mind that what we're trying to do is to come up with a package that protects Second Amendment rights but also makes a meaningful difference in reducing violence. We're not going to eliminate it completely. And so the package that we put forward will have an impact on handguns by instituting uh, a universal background check system to make sure that people can't, uh, who shouldn't have any kind of gun, uh, aren't able to go in and purchase them, whether they're at a gun show or in a store because somebody's not doing the checks uh, that they need. We're talking about making sure that we crack down on straw purchasers, people who go into a store, buy a bunch of guns, and then turn around immediately uh, and dump them uh, in the hands of people who shouldn't get them. Those things will have an impact on handgun violence. When it comes to assault weapons and these high, uh, you know, high capacity magazine clips, the concern is, for example, in Aurora, when uh, a young person can go into a theater and shoot off a uh, hundred rounds in less than a minute. The, the potential for large-scale fatalities are increased. And these are weapons of war. Uh, they're generally not used for hunting. They're not used uh, for uh, the kinds of things that uh, we would think sportsmen or hunters or people who are just looking to protect their homes uh, are, uh, are trying to use them for. And so for us to uh, restrict some of those high capacity magazines and some of those weapons that really belong in the war theater, that probably can save some lives. It's not going to solve every problem, but it can be a meaningful part 
of an over, overall uh, uh, effort to reduce gun violence in our country. Mr. President, in response to the question that Kira just had regarding guns, uh, Vice President Biden has said that people have nothing to worry about in terms of the government coming to take away their guns. Right. But if people own guns that are currently legal mm -hmm. and the government passes a law to make those guns illegal, isn't that exactly what you'd be doing? Well, no. Look, you know, I think that people are going to be able to buy all kinds of guns uh, and use them legally for protection, for sport, for hunting. Uh, what we're saying is there may be a small category of weapons that we think really uh, can drastically increase the incidence of gun violence, and we already have some restrictions. I mean, we can't purchase a grenade launcher uh, from a store, uh, although there may be some folks who want to buy those. Uh, and the reason is we think that, on balance, uh, the Second Amendment does not automatically assume that any weapon that's available uh, you can automatically purchase. And so this is uh, a, a package that we're seeing some bipartisan support for. Uh, what I said was that uh, I recognize there's a lot of passions on this issue, that people in rural communities, for example, feel differently about these issues than uh, folks in urban communities. And we've got to be respectful of regional differences, but there are some common sense steps that we can take right now to reduce gun violence. and. My hope and expectation is, is that Congress actually puts these to a vote, uh, and we'll have a vigorous debate about all these issues. Uh, but you know, I, I can tell you that having visited Newtown and visited with those parents uh, just a, a couple of days after uh, this horrific incident, uh, anybody who talked to those parents or the siblings of those who were killed would say, uh, we've got to crack down and do something to prevent this kind of violence. Even if we're reducing the odds that it's going to happen uh, you know, just a bit and saving a few lives, uh, it's well worth it. Mr. President, let's transition to the economy next and go to one of the top voted YouTube questions that was submitted. This one comes from Marquez Brownlee. Let's watch. Hi, Mr. President. My name is Marquez, and I'm a student in New Jersey. While I saw your recent proposal to adjust the minimum wage in the United States, that's good news for students like me, but could be bad news for businesses in the U.S. with their increased expenses. So my question to you was, what were your plans to keep high-tech businesses and jobs in the United States when other countries don't have the same restrictions? Well, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that our overall strategy uh, has to be to attract new jobs and manufacturing back into the United States. And so I laid out a whole uh, range of proposals, changing our tax code so we're incentivizing companies to stay here instead of moving overseas, making sure that we're creating uh, hubs of advanced manufacturing here in the United States. We've got models where we're already seeing that happen. Making sure that we're training uh, our workforce for the jobs that exist right now. Uh, that can have a huge impact. So there are a wide range of, of efforts that we've got to uh, move forward on to ensure that this is the best place to do business in the world. Now, when it comes to the minimum wage, what we've seen is that uh, most studies indicate that, in fact, it does not have a big impact on employment, but it does have a big impact on uh, a portion of our workforce that works full time, but right now is still in poverty. Even if they're working 40 hours a week, they are still making less than is required to get above the poverty line. And you know, the truth is, is that the purchasing power for the minimum wage is still significantly lower than it was back in the 80s. And what we would do would be able to set that uh, mark and then index it so that the purchasing power from a minimum wage does not continually decline every time there's inflation. Uh, this, by the way, was an idea that uh, wasn't just uh, proposed by me. It was also proposed by uh, Mr. Romney uh, during the presidential campaign. I don't think people uh, would suggest that somehow he wanted to be tough on business. But, but what we've seen generally uh, over the last uh, 20 years is that increases in productivity in our economy uh, are helping a lot of folks at the top, less folks in the middle and at the bottom. And wages and incomes have not gone up even as productivity and the profits from productivity have gone sky high. And there are a lot of countries that are competing very well. Uh, some of our toughest competitors, countries like Germany, for example, who in fact uh, have seen greater wage and income growth. This is just one portion 
uh, of our efforts to make sure that uh, workers are also benefiting from uh, the hard work that uh, we're all doing. Mr. But President, if, if, if I may jump in, mm -hmm. I am curious about what the minimum wage will do to just regular people, the minimum wage raising it will do to regular people like me. I've been in a situation where minimum wage has been raised and I've had to let go to employees from a uh, nonprofit because we just couldn't afford the wages anymore. But as a mom, I worry about, you know, how that's going to affect the bottom line when I go to the grocery store, you know, when I go to get that Starbucks in the morning after dropping my kids off at school or at the gas pump, you know, how will the minimum wage affect what I buy day to day as companies are having to raise their prices to accommodate the minimum wage? That, that concerns me, you know. Well, as, as right, and, and I guess what I'm, uh, I guess I'd make two points, Kira. First of all, um, the fact of the matter is, corporate profits are at record highs, right? So what's happening right now is not that corporations and most companies would be somehow obliged to go out of business because they're providing a little higher wage to minimum wage workers. It might have some modest impact on their profits, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, if we're going to have a society in which we've got broad-based prosperity, those same businesses also have to worry about the customers have money in their pockets. You know, Henry Ford, uh, when people asked him, why is it that you're giving these big raises to your assembly workers, he said, the only way I'm going to be able to sell enough of my product, these cars, is to make sure that the people who are building them can actually afford to buy one. And what's always made America's economy stand out, what's driven its growth, is mm -hmm. the fact that we've built this big, thriving middle class. We don't just have a bunch of folks at the bottom who are scraping by, and then a few folks at the top who are doing uh, incredibly well. And so what we want to do is just make sure that if you work hard in this society, that you've got a living wage. Nobody's going to be uh, getting rich uh, on $9 an hour. They're still going to be struggling. But it could make the difference between whether they can afford to buy groceries uh, or whether or not uh, they are going to a food bank. Uh, and my suspicion is that you'll still be able to get your Starbucks uh, as a consequence. Mr. President, I'm going to go to John Green next, who has a question that was actually also the number one voted question in the economy section on YouTube. John? Hi, Mr. President. So uh, almost all economists agree uh, that we should stop minting pennies. Uh, in addition to costing more than a penny to mint, uh, they're really economically inefficient because they don't work as currency. I mean, you can't even use them in public toll booths. Uh, I, uh, this is a pet issue of mine, I guess. I know it's a small issue. We're talking about maybe savings to the federal government of $100 million over the course of 10 years. But it's also really obvious. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, many other countries have gotten rid of their pennies, and uh, they haven't seen prices rise. And uh, it hasn't been an issue at all. It's a really obvious thing. Uh, it's not a particularly interesting or uh, partisan thing, but it's really obvious. So my question to you is, why haven't we done it? You know, uh, I got to tell you, John, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things where I think people get attached emotionally to the way things have been. Right? And we all remember, at least those of us of a certain age, some of you are a lot younger than me, but you know, we remember our piggy banks and you know, counting up all our pennies and then taking them in and uh, you know, getting a dollar bill or a couple of dollars from them. Uh, and maybe that's the reason why uh, people haven't gotten around to it. Uh, I will tell you that you're right. This is not going to be a, a huge savings for government. Uh, but anytime we're spending more money on something that people don't actually use, that's an example of something we should probably change. And one of the things that you see chronically in government is it's very hard to get rid of things that don't work so that we can then invest in the things that do. Uh, and the penny ends up being, I think, a good metaphor for some of the larger problems that we've got. I'll give you an example. Um, we have probably 16 different agencies dealing with businesses. Small business, large business, exports, domestic, lending, uh, marketing, all kinds of stuff that we do. A lot of those services are really good. But uh, they're in a bunch of different agencies. And so the average small business person a lot of times has no idea where to go and how to access this help that could help them build their small business or help them sell overseas. What I've said to Congress is give me the authority to reorganize agencies that were designed back in the 1930s for a 21st century economy. And we'll, we'll have one agency. 
that deals with all kinds of business issues. It'll streamline uh, our operations, reduce overhead, make us more customer friendly. And the problem and the reason that we can't do it is Congress hasn't given me the authority, in part because uh, the way Congress works is, is that uh, committee jurisdictions uh, are spread out matching these various agencies. And so there may be some members of Congress who say, well, I don't want to give up this little piece of uh, uh, leverage that I've got over a particular agency, even though it's not efficient. So we're constantly trying to reduce these inefficiencies. We've made some progress eliminating paperwork, going back and looking at regulations that don't work, et cetera. Everything that we can do administratively, uh, we are prepared to do. Uh, but the penny is an example of something that I need legislation for, and, uh, and, and frankly, given all the big issues that we have to deal with day in, uh -huh. day out, a lot of times it just doesn't, uh, you know, we, we're not able to get to it. We haven't heard from Lamar yet. Uh, let's go to Lamar in New York City. Hi there. On the topic of legislation, um, I'm an entrepreneur, and uh, high-tech startups are an important engine of the American economy. When I go around and talk to other entrepreneurs, what I hear is, they're worried that if they become successful, they're going to be targeted by software patent trolls. These are firms that collect software patents just for the purpose of litigation and you know, getting money out of small companies that can't afford uh, patent defense. It's very expensive. So I know you've made a lot of progress on patent reform, but I'm wondering, what are you planning to do to limit the abuses of software patents? For example, would you be supportive of limiting software patents to only five years long? Well, I, I think it's a great question, and you're right. Uh, a couple of years ago, we began a process of patent reform. Uh, we actually passed some legislation that made progress on some of these issues, but it hasn't captured all the problems. And uh, the folks that you're talking about are a classic example. Uh, they don't actually produce anything themselves. They're just trying to essentially leverage uh, and, and hijack somebody else's idea and see if they can uh, extort some money out of them. And you know, sometimes these things are challenging because we also want to make sure that the patents are long enough, that you know, people's intellectual property is protected. We've got to balance that with making sure that they're not so long that uh, innovation uh, is reduced. And, but I do think that our efforts at patent reform only went about halfway to where we need to go. And what we need to do is pull together um, you know, additional stakeholders and see if we can build some additional consensus on some smarter patent laws. This, this is true, by the way, across the board when it comes to uh, high-tech issues. The technology is changing so fast. We want to protect privacy. We want to protect people's civil liberties. We want to make sure the Internet stays open. And I'm an uh, I'm, I'm ardent believer that uh, what's powerful about the Internet is, is its openness and, and the capacity for people to uh, get out there and just introduce a new idea with low barriers uh, to entry. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, you know, people's intellectual property is protected. And whether it's you know, how we're dealing with copyright, how we're dealing with patents, uh, how we're dealing with pr uh, piracy issues, uh, what we've tried to do is to be an honest broker between the various uh, stakeholders and to continue to refine it uh, hopefully keeping up with the technology, which doesn't mean that there aren't occasionally going to be some, uh, some problems that we still haven't identified and we uh, have to keep on working on. Mr. President, another major economic issue is, of course, immigration. And that's something that you spend a lot of time talking about lately. Uh, and it's also something that Jackie Guerrero has been thinking a lot about out in Los Angeles. Let's go to Jackie. Hi, Mr. President. Um, your administration has deported a record high number of 1.5 million undocumented immigrants more than your predecessor. And I know your administration took some steps last year to protect unintended undocumented immigrants from being deported. However, many people say that those efforts weren't enough. What I'd like to know is what you're gonna do now until the time immigration reform is passed to ensure that more people are not being deported and families aren't being broken apart. Well, uh, look, Jackie, this is something that I've struggled with uh, throughout my presidency. The problem is, is that, um, you know, I'm, the President of the United States, I'm not uh, uh, the Emperor of the United States. Uh, my job is to execute laws that are passed. And Congress right now uh, has not changed what I consider to be a broken immigration system. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, is that we have certain obligations to enforce the laws that are in place, even if we think that in many cases the results may be tragic. Uh, and what we have been able to do is to make sure that 
we're focusing our enforcement resources on criminals as opposed to somebody who, who's here just trying to work and look after their families. Uh, what we have tried to do is administratively uh, uh, reduce the, the burdens and hardships on families being separated. And what we've done is obviously pass a deferred action, which made sure that the dream, uh, uh, you know, the, the dreamers, young people who were brought here and think of themselves as Americans, are American except for uh, their papers, that they're not deported. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, we've kind of stretched uh, our administrative flexibility as much as we can. And that's why making sure that we get comprehensive immigration reform done is so important. Uh, and frankly, my goal is to make sure that we get that done in the next four or five months. And the reason is, is be precisely because uh, every day that we wait, every week that we wait, every month that we wait, there are going to be some stories that break our hearts. And more importantly, we're going to continue to have an economy that is stifled by a really inefficient system where not only uh, are we deporting folks, but we also have a legal immigration system that is so bottlenecked that it forces sometimes people into the illegal system. It prevents us from recruiting and keeping uh, top flight engineers and uh, tech people who are ready to work here or invest here, but because the legal immigration system is so broken, we're not uh, able to attract them and so oftentimes we train them here and then we send them uh, back to their countries of origin uh, to start businesses there. The good news is I think the, the opportunity for immigration reform has never been higher. We're seeing some good bipartisan uh, discussions and possible legislation and, and my hope uh, is that we can actually get this done in the next few months. That's great because that kind of leads into my next question which your support for gay rights has continued to grow over the last year. Um, and I'd like to know if you're committed to supporting binational same-sex couples in the immigration reform bill that you're hoping to pass. Uh, recently, Mar Marco Rubio did an interview with BuzzFeed where he was asked this question. He said that if this became a central issue, that it would make it much harder to get done. So I'd like to know from you if this is something that you're willing to stand behind to ensure that same-sex binational couples are included in the immigration reform bill, or if this is something that you're willing to uh, compromise on? Well, first of all, I think it's important, Jackie, to say that uh, my support on LGBT issues didn't start last year, right? It started when I came into office making sure that we had hospital visitations, making sure that uh, uh, federal workers were uh, and, and partners were able to receive uh, benefits, and you know, on through us ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and most recently making sure that same-sex partners were able to get benefits uh, at, when they're serving in the military. Uh, so this is something I care deeply about, uh, and I have said very clearly that uh, I think that people should be treated the same. They should not be treated differently uh, when it comes to any aspect of American life, and that includes our immigration laws. Uh, so I'm, what I'm trying to do right now is to give uh, Democrats and Republicans in the Senate uh, and in the House, the opportunity to work through some of these issues, to uh, see where their compromises are, uh, and not be too heavy-handed uh, in a way that might end up breaking up these discussions, because I think it's very important for us to get immigration reform done. Uh, but we've been very clear that we think that uh, it makes sense for same-sex couples to be treated the same uh, when it comes to immigration laws and every other law. Mr. President, let's switch gears for a moment. We wanted to have everyone get the chance to ask you a more personal question during the hangout and let's start with Lamore and Lee. Hi, thanks. Um, Mr. President, have your daughters expressed any interest in pursuing a career in science or engineering? You know, uh, they're doing really well in science and math so far uh, and that's encouraging uh, <laughs> that, that they actually like it uh, and they have fun doing it. Um, Malia just turned 14, Sasha's 11, uh, I, I don't think they're yet at the age where they've kind of determined uh, what their career path is going to be. And what Michelle and I try to encourage is just saying you know, math and science is part of your overall educational experience. We don't want you intimidated by it. We want you to continue to pursue it so that your options remain open uh, as you get older. Uh, but one of the things that I really strongly believe in uh, is that we need to have more uh, 
girls interested in math, science, and engineering. Uh, we've got half the population that uh, is way underrepresented in those fields, and that means we've got a whole bunch of talent uh, that downstream uh, is not being encouraged the way they need to. And, and so uh, the White House Office of Women and Girls has been partnering with the Department of Education so that our STEM education agenda, trying to get more math and science and, and technology education in the schools, also focuses on making sure underrepresented groups like, uh, uh, like girls uh, are encouraged in these fields. Uh, Mr. President, my question is, for those of us who disagree with you politically, what's one book you'd recommend we read to better understand your political philosophy better? Uh, other than my own, I assume. <laughs> other, other than your own. <laughs> I don't want to be pitching my own book. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have to tell you that uh, where I draw inspiration from uh, uh, is the writings of Lincoln. And you know, I'm assuming you're a Republican. Well, this was uh, you know, our first Republican president. Uh, but the, the core philosophy that he espouses, uh, this sense that you know, we are this nation uh, that is built on freedom and individual initiative uh, and free enterprise, but there are some things we do in common together, whether it's building railroads or setting up land lease colleges or uh, making sure that we've got uh, investments in science uh, and that our, our nation only works when everybody has that same opportunity, that uh, we're all open uh, to, to being able to uh, participate if we work hard uh, in the incredible bounty of this nation. Um, you know, that, that's, that's probably where I start uh, in terms of political philosophy. It, it, my inauguration speech, I think, was reflective of that. I start with the Declaration of Independence and you know, probably Lincoln's writings and uh, Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail uh, and the Bible. And you know, th those, are, those are some pretty good places for me to start. Now, I can recommend some good novels for you, too, if you want. But uh, in terms of <laughs> political philosophy, uh, that's probably where I start. Mr. President, I want to shift now to the topic of education, something you spent a lot of your student union speech talking about. And let's go back to Lamore in New York City. Thanks. Um, on Tuesday, you challenged American high schools to better equip graduates for the demands of a high-tech economy. Yeah. When I attended high school, I had to take a foreign language requirement. So my question is, can we make it a national effort to also add a computer programming language requirement? I think it makes sense. I really do. And you know, part of what I'm trying to do here is to uh, make sure that we're working with uh, high schools and school districts all across the country to, to make the high school experience relevant for young people, not all of whom are going to get a four-year college degree or an advanced degree. Uh, and, you know, I think that the concept of vocational education uh, got a bad rap at a certain point because the perception was, well, you know, we're tracking folks into, uh, you know, blue-collar jobs and then the, you know, we're reserving white-collar jobs for a certain group. All those categories, I think, have, have uh, uh, eroded. So, you know, you look at somebody like Mark Zuckerberg. I, I was sitting next to him uh, at dinner uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and he basically said, you know, he taught himself programming primarily because he was interested in games. And there are a whole bunch of young people out there, I suspect, who, if in high school, are given the opportunity to figure out, here's how you can design your own games. But it requires you to know math. It requires you to know science. Or uh, you know, here's what a career in graphic design looks like. And we're going to start setting those uh, uh, you know, programs in our high schools, not waiting till a community college. And then you can apprentice with somebody who's already uh, a graphic designer in your area. What it does not only is, is to prepare young people who may choose not to go to a four-year college to be job ready, uh, but it also engages kids because they feel like, I get this. This is not just me sitting there slouching uh, in the back of the room while somebody's lecturing. And, and I think 
given how pervasive uh, computers and uh, the Internet is now and, and how integral it is into our economy and how fascinated kids are with it, I want to make sure that they know act uh, how to actually uh, produce stuff uh, using computers and not simply consume stuff. Mr. President, uh, you know, you're speaking to a divided House of Congress the night, of course, and you know, a Pew Research poll recently said that only about 25 percent of Americans trust the federal government to actually do the right thing most of the time. Uh, John had a question about sort of government dysfunction as it relates to climate change. Let's go to John. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, one of the problems that we have on YouTube is that instead of discussing policy, we end up discussing ideology a lot. So instead of, for instance, talking about which guns should be for sale to private citizens, we end up talking about the abstract idea of gun control. And that seems really problematic to me when it comes to a big civilizational problem like climate change, because we can never get to the policy conversation as long as we're stuck in an ideological conversation. I really appreciated your robust defense of climate science in your speech. and, and uh, your embrace of executive action. But in the end, I think the real work uh, is probably going to have to be done uh, with Congress. And so my question is, is both about YouTube, uh, the discourse among individuals, but also discourse in Congress. How do we get past that ideological rigidity and that divisiveness to have a policy discussion about what's actually the most efficient way to reduce our carbon emissions? Well, uh, uh, a couple of things that we've tried to do. Uh, is, first of all, focus on things that, even if there wasn't climate change, we should want to do anyway, but has the added benefit of reducing carbon in the atmosphere. So, for example, when we uh, worked with the automakers to, through voluntary action, uh, implement a, uh, a doubling of fuel efficiency standards on cars, that that is uh, going to have a huge impact on uh, carbon in the atmosphere, but it's also good economics because it means that consumers are saving money at the pump. It means that uh, U.S. automakers are competing with foreign automakers that previously had had, the, uh, had a corner on the, uh, the, the small car market or the fuel efficient car market. Uh, and so that's gotten us part of the way there. The next steps, though, are going to be more challenging. And you know, some of this is ideological, some of it is economic, and, and it's not all partisan. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, there are some Democrats, for example, who uh, represent states or districts that are heavily reliant on old power plants and are more heavily manufacturing based. And the truth is, is that if you produce uh, power using old power plants, you're going to be emitting more carbon. But to upgrade those plants means energy is going to be a little bit more expensive, at least on the front end. Uh, so uh, it, it, at, at, at the core, we have to do something that's really difficult for any society to do, and that is to take actions now where the benefits are going to be coming down the road, or at least we're going to be avoiding big problems down the road. And it's hard when people are thinking day to day about bread and butter uh, issues. That's true in our own lives. It's true as a society in the whole. What I'm optimistic about is that uh, we can continue to make progress without slowing economic growth. Uh, and the same steps that we took with respect to energy efficiency on cars, we can take on buildings. We can take on uh, 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 appliances. We can make sure that uh, new power plants that are being built are more efficient than the old ones. And we can continue to put research and our support behind clean energy uh, that is going to continue to help us transition away from uh, dirtier fuels. And um, you know, we've made progress. But I, I, I've got to tell you, I, John, I, I wish I could say that uh, you know, the way Washington works, that it's a rational, reasoned, uh, policy wonk conversation uh, where you would you know, be very comfortable. Uh, that's not uh, what motivates folks a lot of times around here. What motivates folks is uh, getting reelected. And uh, for a lot of members of Congress, uh, what they're responding to is, is a public that is still uh, not entirely convinced that this is an urgent problem. And part of my job, I think, is to use the bully pulpit to help uh, raise uh, people's awareness 
because if the public cares about it, eventually Congress acts. If the public doesn't care about it, it's very hard uh, to get big stuff done uh, because, you know, legislators uh, respond to mm -hmm. uh, their constituents sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Kira, did Mr. you want to? Yeah, yeah I, go ahead. well, just on this interest on this subject of of government and how Washington works, I I've been thinking about this a lot because I I do remember clearly in 2008 you you ran on a platform of of really trying to become one of the most transparent administrations in American history. However, with recent leaked guidelines regarding drone strikes on American citizens and Benghazi and closed door hearings on the budget and deficit, it, it just feels a lot less transparent than I think we had all hoped it would be. How has the reality of the presidency changed that promise? And what can we do moving forward to, to kind of get back to that promise? Well, actually, on a whole bunch of fronts, we've kept that promise. This is the most transparent administration in history. Uh, and you know, I can document how that is the case. Everything from uh, every visitor that comes into the White House is now a part of the public record. That's something that we changed. Just about every uh, law that we pass, every rule that we uh, uh, implement, we put online for everybody there to see. Uh, there are a handful of issues, mostly around national security, where people have legitimate questions, where they're still concerned uh, about whether or not we have all the information we need. Benghazi, by the way, is not a good example of that. That was largely driven by campaign stuff because everything about that, we've had more testimony uh, and more paper uh, provided to Congress than ever before, and Congress is sort of running out of things to ask. Uh, but when it comes to things like uh, you know, how we conduct counterterrorism, there are legitimate questions there, and we should have that debate. And what I've tried to do coming into office was to create a legal and a policy framework that uh, respected our traditions and our rule of law. But some of these programs are still classified, which meant that we might have shared them, for example, with the Congressional Intelligence Office, but they're not on the front page of the papers or on the web. But Mr. I President, in response to that yeah. question that Kira just asked regarding drones, a lot of people are very concerned mm -hmm that your administration now believes it's legal to have drone strikes on American citizens and whether or not that's specifically allowed with citizens within the United States. And if that's not true, what will you do to create a legal framework to make American citizens within the United States know that drone st strikes cannot be used against American citizens? Well, uh, first of all, I, I think uh, there has never been a drone used on an American citizen on American soil. And the you know, we respect and have a whole bunch of safeguards in terms of how we conduct counterterrorism operations outside of the United States. The rules out, outside of the United States are going to be different than the rules inside the United States, in part because our capacity to, for example, capture terrorists in the United States are very different than in the foothills or mountains of Afghanistan or Pakistan. Uh, but what I think is absolutely true is that it is not sufficient for citizens to just take my word for it that we're doing the right thing. I so am what the, do you believe I am, I, am, I am the head of the executive branch, and what we've done so far is to try to work with Congress on oversight issues. But part of what I'm going to have to work with Congress on is to make sure that whatever it is that we're providing Congress, that we have mechanisms to also make sure that the public understands what's going on, what the constraints are, what the legal uh, parameters are. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, I take very seriously. I, don't, I, I am not somebody who believes that the president uh, has the authority to do whatever he wants or whatever she wants, whenever they want, just under the guise of counterterrorism. There have to be Mr. legal president. checks and balances on it. Mr. President, before we let everyone else ask a final personal question of you, we'd be remiss not to ask you about an issue that everyone on the Internet is buzzing about today, the Republican filibuster of uh, Senator Hagel for your Secretary of Defense nomination. Are you worried that this, uh, this nomination is not going to go through? Well, uh, here's, here's what we know, that uh, Chuck Hagel, who, by the way, was a member of the Republican caucus, <clears throat> uh, a colleague of all of these folks who uh, 
the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, and others consistently praised when he was still in the Senate, who has two purple stars, uh, two purple hearts, uh, was uh, an extraordinary soldier, uh, was the head of the USO, uh, served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, and is praised by people like Brent Scrowcroft, who was George H.W. Uh, Bush's um, national security advisor, and Colin Powell and others, uh, is eminently qualified to be Secretary of Defense. And the notion that we would see an unprecedented filibuster, just about unprecedented. We've never had a Secretary of Defense filibustered before. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that somebody should get 60 votes. There are only a handful of instances in which there's been any kind of filibuster of anybody uh, for a cabinet position in our history. And what seems to be happening, and this has been growing over time, is uh, uh, the Republican minority in the Senate seem to think that the rule now is that you have to have 60 votes for everything. Well, that's not the rule. The rule is that you're supposed to have a majority of the 100 senators vote on most bills. The filibuster historically has been used selectively for a handful of issues to extend debate. But we don't have a 60-vote rule. Uh, and yet, that's become common practice. Mm -hmm. and, and this is just the latest example. We've seen it on judges. We've seen it on you know, deputy treasury secretaries. Uh, and part of what's happening is it's becoming more and more difficult for people to uh, join our government. So uh, my expectation and hope is, is that Chuck Hagel, who richly deserves uh, to get a vote on the floor of the Senate, uh, will be confirmed as uh, our defense secretary. It's just unfortunate that this kind of politics uh, intrudes at a time when I'm still presiding over uh, a war in Afghanistan and I need a secretary of defense uh, who is coordinating with uh, our allies to make sure that uh, our troops are, are getting uh, the kind of strategy and mission that they deserve. Mr. President, before we let you go, we want to give the rest of our hangout the chance to ask you a personal question. Let's go with Jackie, John, and Kira. Jackie. Hi, Mr. President. Uh, my partner and I are always talking about how fortunate she was to have grown up in Hawaii. She actually went to Kamehameha. And uh, we're in Hawaii, where a majority of people who live there are multi-ethnic. So I wanted to know what how that experience has shaped you as a person? You know, I, I've thought about this a lot. And uh, I, I do think that uh, growing up in Hawaii makes you uh, a little bit different for some of the reasons you talked about. Well, now, first of all, part of it is just the weather is nice all the time. So that kind of <laughs> chills you out. Um, and, and you spend a lot of time outside, and that makes you pretty healthy. But. But it is as much of a melting pot as just about uh, any place in the United States. And for kids to be exposed to different cultures and different religions and, and different outlooks uh, really early in life, uh, I do think has, has an impact. It, 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 it makes you appreciate uh, people's differences as opposed to being scared of them uh, or, or worried about them. And, and I do think that that mm -hmm. attitude is something that I continue to uh, you know, to, to mm -hmm. live by uh, as president. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, my wife, Sarah, who's actually here, um, and I are expecting our second child. We have uh, Hey, Sarah. Hello. Do you already have a bump? Yes, I do. OK, stand up. Let's see it a little bit. <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. good. good. Um, we are expecting our second child. We have uh, a boy named picked out, but uh, Sarah had a question for you. Yes, hello, Mr. President. We are wondering if you prefer the name Eleanor or Alice. Eleanor or Alex? Alice. 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 <laughs> Alice. Um, A-L-I-C-E. You, you know, uh, I, I, I'm going to leave this up to you guys because if I... Oh. No, here's the reason. If I, if I gave a preference <laughs> and you guys went the other way, Forever, this child would say the president doesn't like my name, which could traumatize them. Uh, but the main thing is tell, tell either Eleanor or Alice uh, not to forget to be awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. There you go.
<laughs> Let's go to Kira. I think you just caused more problems for them. Now they're going to be arguing. <laughs> you were supposed to settle. I that. wasn't. Gonna, I, I wasn't going to get involved in this one. Now, if you want to, if it's a boy and you want to name Barack, that's fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mr. President, my family is here with me. Hey guys. These are my, these are my children, Scott, Ruby. Say hi, Mr. President. Hey. And this is my husband, Mark. Hey, Mr. Mark. Mr. President. Hey, Mr. President. I, I like you, the White Sox t-shirt, man. Oh, how could you not? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, you're married, so you know it's Valentine's Day. I do. Yes, I know you know. Now, my husband, Mark Davis, believes that Valentine's Day is just a made-up Hallmark holiday designed to separate him from his hard-earned money, and he never celebrates. Mr. President, on the behalf of all American women, will you please, right now, issue an executive order via Google Hangout for my husband, Mark Davis, to spoil me this Valentine's Day? Can, can, can I just say, Mark, uh, I think here's the general rule. If mom is happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> so, uh, so, so do right, man. Uh, you will pay a higher price later than doing That's the right true. thing during Valentine's Day. Okay, I will. All thank right. you, sir. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. President. We really appreciate you joining us here on Google+. Plus. We'd love to see you here for another Fireside Hangout real soon. Thanks a lot. I had a great time, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right.